Okay, so uh, folks, uh, welcome to the MIT KIT webinar. Today, the 2nd of April, 2015. Today, we have a very special presentation. We actually have uh, a team of three people presenting on this uh, awesome piece of work um, called Scepter. Uh, I uh, will save time by not introducing a full bio of, of Art uh, and, and Eric and Mark, uh, but uh, we are in for a treat today, folks, because uh, in addition to the presentation, you'll see a demo that Art, uh, Art and Eric will be running. Uh, we would ask you to defer questions till uh, toward the last quarter of uh, um, you know, quarter hour of, the, of the presentation so that Art can actually get through the slides uh, and the demo. If you do have an urgent, urgent question, just use the chat box uh, and uh, we can see your chat and um, uh, I can read out the question or, or Eric who's sitting next to Art can read out the question to Art. Uh, okay, Art, uh, all yours. Cool. Um, so we are recording this and just want to introduce ourselves um, so you can recognize our faces and voices. Um, I'm Arthur Brock. I'm Eric Harrison. And on the phone, we had. Uh, I'm, um, yeah, me, Mark Clifton. I'm, uh, I'm dialed in. I, I suppose I could turn the video on for just a second. You can see and wave. Hello, folks. <laughs> cool. Um, we're calling in from Woodstock right now. And we just want to thank um, Scott David and Thomas Hajala for uh, inviting us to share our work. And uh, hope it's really going to be useful and interesting. So let's jump in to the demo, um, or to the slides. So make sure everybody can see the slides. You should be able to bring that up. So first, just a little bit of context for what we're talking about today. A lot of this emerged out of our work in the Metacurrency project, where we discovered we really needed some radically different infrastructure um, that just wasn't available and um, to, to meet our requirements for having things really be distributed and decentralized interoperable and resilient in that, not brittle APIs, but really um, play well together, uh, and composable, being able to mash new things together, make mashups of things that exist, um, and still maintain meaning, so to have them kind of be semantic. And what we were looking for was stuff that really went, goes way beyond what's currently being done in, in blockchain or APIs or RDS. And uh, so, um, we had some breakthroughs, so it, it seemed like a pretty daunting task to uh, look at rewriting a lot of basic infrastructure. We had some breakthroughs in our design process that kind of bolstered our confidence that we could start at a low level and build from there and have that actually um, end up giving us everything that we need and have it bootstrap gracefully, have it actually build on itself well. Um, in particular, one of the breakthroughs we want to talk about, because it's where the name of the platform comes from, was with regard to receptors and receptivity. Um, and it makes a big difference in your orientation, you say. Yeah, so what happened to us was that we were trying to understand what the ontological framework was of our work, how we were going to build ontologically in sort of that standard computer science -y way of uh, the object-oriented approach, or what are the base units that you build out? And what, what came to us was this experience of realizing that that ontological approach wasn't going to cut it for us. And that instead, if we started from a base uh, understanding that what there is is a, a general receptivity out of which you can make sense of um, what comes next. And, and we were thinking about this in terms of a lot of language, right? You can, we, as, as, um, people who are trying to make meaning of things that happen, we can listen and hear things and make meaning out from them without having some base underlying ontological um, unit. Because even if, so if you're using the example of language, it, you can think of the fact that there's this base ontology of phones and phonemes and word, and word parts, and you can assume that language is constructed ontologically that way, but that's actually not true. Because if I speak with a French out accent that's outrageous, I can still understand the meaning of that. I can build um, 
uh, I can come to that sense because I've got a basic rece receptive capacity. Yeah, and we also have the capacity to redefine on the fly and, and things like that, that that speaks to being able to receive something and then define it rather than have everything be defined in advance. Um, so um, we really, what Scepter is, there's a lot of, there's, in our strategy, there's some different layers to this project. And Scepter is really the underlying low level protocols for how to structure data, organize processing, and communicate, um, as well as share code and that kind of thing. And that's what we're going to be looking at today is these, these low level things. And just so you know, this is built in, what we're doing is we're building it in C for speed and portability. It's trying to keep the infrastructure really lightweight, compile to any platform. Um, we see this eventually even potentially being embedded in things like, you know, Wi-Fi routers and stuff like that that want to be able to, to, to really compile it over to any platform. Um, but in the demos that you'll see, they're built um, for the browser on JavaScript to be able to visualize some of the stuff. So we're actually going to start with something that's a little different than Scepter that Mark built. Um, and uh, it's called HOPE, Higher Order Programming Environment. And uh, he took a bunch of the, the principles we're using in Scepter in terms of this receptor-oriented programming with membranes and built a platform in C Sharp. And uh, he put together a little demo of that. So, yeah. This is a short introduction of the higher order programming environment, or HOPE. With HOPE, we use both specialized and general purpose autonomous computing units called receptors to compose rich data transformations and visualizations. All data is semantic. It carries both value and structural meaning. Receptors, like cells, absorb specific semantic data perform computations on the data and release the computational results as semantic data into the inter-receptor space where other receptors process the new semantic data. Membranes define bidirectional permeability within receptor groups to control data flow and create computational islands. The demo you are about to see illustrates some of these concepts. We will utilize several different receptors to extract specific information from a website and to interact with the website's information different ways than originally intended. The website we'll be working with is NASA's Astronomy Post of the Day, APOD website. So let's get started. First, we will select the APOD receptor and add it to the surface. This receptor will query the astronomy post for a specific date, but it depends on a general purpose HTML scraper to extract the HTML. Once it gets the HTML, it extracts some content, such as the image, the title, and description, and issues this as a web image semantic instance. Let's add a signal creator receptor so that we can feed date to the APOD receptor. Now, this is a general purpose receptor in that, in the sense that we can select the semantic type that we want to create, and the UI generates the uh, entry fields dynamically for us. Now, it doesn't really know that a date could be picked, uh, could be selected with a date control, so it just gives us text boxes for the different uh, uh, value types within the date semantic type. So I'm going to put in Valentine's Day of 2014, and we'll click on Create. Now notice here, we have a connection now between the signal creator and the APOD receptor, and that the semantic type that is being conveyed from the signal creator receptor to the APOD receptor, that semantic type is date, because that is, after all, what we selected here in this dialog and APOD is receptive to date semantic types. Now let's add the web page scraper receptor. And you're going to see something interesting. You'll notice 
how there's this interaction now between APOD and the web scraper. What's happening here is that APOD, once it gets the scraped HTML, it's actually generating a web image semantic type instance. That web image, as we noted over here, contains a URL. And because receptors can also respond to subtypes within a semantic type instance, the web page scraper is actually responding to the URL in the web image instance as well. We don't really want this behavior, so we're going to create a membrane around the web page scraper. And we're going to configure it so that we are permeable only to the URL as a root semantic type, and not as a subtype. And we also have an outbound permeability for the web page image. I'm sorry, for the web, web page HTML. And now we have stopped that feedback loop. Now let's get to the fun part. We're going to add an image viewer. And uh, that popped up a separate viewing window. Now that my screen space is limited here in this video, so we're going to have to switch back and forth between things. We'll put a membrane around the image viewer as well to constrict its uh, data transfer of uh, semantic types as well. So what we're interested in here is a web image. And there we go. Now you can see over here, we have this beautiful picture. Now let's quickly add a couple other receptors. One is going to be a text display receptor for the description. So I'll add that. And we want to restrict it specifically to the description semantic type instance. And then I'm going to do something interesting. I'm going to add a web page viewer receptor. And what I want to do here is take just the title. So we're going to say we're receptive, permeable, in for the title. And I'm going to configure this receptor for doing a Google search on the title itself. So we're going to add this little URL with this token that is called search, which takes the title, replaces the text in the title with this, uh, with this token, and performs a Google search. So now let's just re-trigger this whole thing again. And move this out of the way. We can see the semantic type instances being moved about to the different receptors. And now here is the result. We have these three different tabs. We can reorganize this a little bit. So let's move the text over here. And let's move the image down below the text. And here's our Google search, where we can now see things that relate to light from the heart. We can look at, for example, another date. There go the different semantic type instances. And and here's the result. So in conclusion, um, this really is just a teaser of how you can use Hope to create dynamic and rich applications. And I uh, encourage you to visit the higherorderprogramming.com website for more examples, articles, and videos. Thank you for watching. So we wanted to share this. Um, demo with you because what it does is it really gives a, a visual sense, a visceral sense of what of the kind of composability you get when you start thinking this way in terms of reception and you use semantic data that can identify itself and you can create membranes for allowing the flow of information and, and have this, stand, this receptive stance of listening for what gets sent and then responding to it. It, it seems very, very powerful to us. And so although the work that we're doing in SEPTA right now is very low level because it replaces a lot of um, elements in the, <clears throat> in the computing stack, um, we wanted to have something that gives a, a sense of what, be, what we think will become possible. And Mark's work really does show that. We really like it. Cool. And as Mark was mentioning, a couple more things in the chat. Um, 
So uh, the way receptors are set up in uh, SEPTR are a little bit different than Mark's receptors in that um, they're still a these major composable units for computing communication, but our receptors all already have membranes. They're not just in, to, in one open space. And um, that means some of them are actually, oh, and, they, and they can be organized fractally. So some of them are really big, like the virtual machine host that all the receptors on your machine run you know, is a kind of receptor. And some of them can be really small, almost like a, a function call, like what's my location, or filter this list type of receptor. In fact, you could think of the membrane that Mark was throwing around a receptor uh, on his thing as a type of receptor, as a type of filter receptor whose job is just to filter things that come to it. Um, and so, and also everything in between. So in our system, everything is receptors at all those levels. And receptors send and receive signals, right? Their, the whole point is that they receive things. And there's a, a principle that we unpacked about um, the way carriers work with a protocol and a particular variant according to that protocol, a, a signal that happens at all these different layers. So every different protocol that we have in our computing stack, whether it's talking to memory or to the hard drive or to your keyboard or to the network or you know establishing sessions with TCP or whatever, all of these things essentially are using the same pattern. Even, so, even at the highest level, too, like sending emails or having very large, much larger constructions around, you know, in some kind of a, um, a ticketing system, sending requests at that level. So all the way from the highest level down to the lowest follow this pattern. Right. So we, we, what we want to do is be able to replicate this pattern at every level in a fractal pattern. They also, receptors are a lightweight virtual machine. Lightweight because they, they nest inside of each other and we don't want to reduplicate a lot of infrastructure, but a virtual machine because they need to be able to run code, but they're also connected to a slice of a data engine for persistence. Um, so, Scepter is basically all constructed out of these receptors. And in sum, their job is to manage coherence. Um, so they manage their membranes, what can come in or out of any receptor and any transformation that happens. You want to talk about encapsulation? Go ahead. But, so the, the, the transition here between receptors and coherence is related to the, the general computer science notion of encapsulation, which is a really big deal because we, we, we've studied it. We know how important it is for things like efficiency, for reliability, and for composability. That's why object-oriented computing was invented. That's why you have function calls that are reusable. Um, but in our system, what we've, we've done is we've thought of all of those things together under this notion of coherence which means that each receptor becomes a master of its own domain and also allows for another important aspect of encapsulation, which is security and integrity, meaning that every, every um, receptor is integral and doesn't have other things managing or breaking its integrity. Um, so that's how they, they manage their, their membranes. That's an edge that no, nothing else can pierce. It has to go through their own transformation process as things come in or out of membranes. They store their state, both ephemeral and memory, and more persistent. They transform their state by running code. That's the whole point of a virtual machine. They also, and we're not going to talk very much about this today, but they also escape data. They index their collections of data and compute on relationships between things, and you think this ends up being a very important aspect of coherence because sometimes you may have a, a receptor collecting some things and then you want it to, to actually be, be providing information, like sorting these things or comparing things or you know, under, sort of being able to create a texture to a landscape of lots of different data that it's holding. Um, and then here's one of the really interesting things that's, that's different. <laughs> so far, this is kind of all a virtual, it's like fractal virtual machines, but uh, our approach in Scepter is to also make, to build in Byzantine fault tolerance at this really low level. In other words, be able to allow them to be distributed so that we can run multiple instances of a receptor and they synchronize with each other. So that one computer may fall offline, a server may fall offline, or you're, you may be running something on your phone or your laptop and your laptop is offline, or other, other things like that. And 
there can be a, a version on a server online that is still receiving and sending information, and then when you turn on your laptop again later, it can synchronize and you get, get back into state. Um, but it also allows fully distributed applications, sort of akin to blockchain crypto type solutions, it's just building it in at, the, at a very low level. Um, so if Scepter is built out of fractal receptors, then what do you build these receptors out of? And how do you get that kind of level of coherence and integrity and composability? Well, our answer is that everything is stored as semantic trees. Yeah, so one of the things that, that you run into, interestingly, I think, in computing is the ways that we uh, are always serializing information and then kind of rehydrating it, giving it its meaning again. So we, we serialize it all down to, to bits to write to a hard drive or all down to uh, ASCII characters to put into an octet stream and just stream octets on, on a, you know, socket and that kind of thing. But then we have to reinterpret all those octets again or all those characters again, like uh, when we write code. It's just a bunch of ASCII characters, but then when we want to run that code, we have to identify all the tokens, we have to lex it and parse it and build it back into a syntax tree to understand what the code is supposed to be doing, because the code isn't actually just linear ASCII. The code is nested functions and everything. So we are actually preserving that structure in semantic relational trees. So we have a few videos here. I'm sorry they're in videos instead of us talking directly, but it just for purposes of making sure that they, they ran at the same time and we're not switching screen sharing, we have them uh, uh, coming up, just sort of like the whole point. So we use semantic trees to store data and process. And so um, one of the things about data, you can't instantiate meaningless data. In other words, you can't store an int. You can store an age or a shoe size or you know something like that, but you have to actually say the meaning of it when you're storing it. And that's part of what's stored with it. Um, and data always carries then that meaning associated with it, as well as its connection to other components. Semantic trees in Scepter are like the words of a normal CPU. They're a base data unit. So our receptors act as lightweight virtual machines that instead of operating on 32-bit or 64-bit words, they operate on the full semantic tree. Our intention here is to try to build meaning in at as low a level as possible into the computing stack. So. These base units themselves are composed, just like a regular word in a CPU is composed of bits that the CPU can shift or add, etc. In Scepter, the semantic trees are built out of named structures that themselves are composition of other semantic trees. So the example we have here is that of a home location, which is a semantically identified latitude and longitude, a geolocation. So its structure is a lat long. Its semantic name is home location. Now, what is a lat long? Well, a lat long is a composition of a latitude and a longitude, each of which are structurally a floating point number. So let's take a look at one of those. What is, the com what is a floating point number? Well, it is a composition of a mantissa and an exponent, semantically, which themselves are both integers in structure. Uh, an exponent, as an integer, looks like this. It is a series of power of two, base two exponents that themselves structurally are bits. So you see in Scepter we have this form of semantic alternation where you alternate between the meaning and the structure as you go down the tree. One thing we should note is that um, not all of the data gets stored down to the bit level like that as a tree because that would be inefficient. We, although we do want to make it accessible so you can actually go and use the same interfaces to access a bit semantically, we will have, um, and we do have um, storage in there that uses actually current computing base types um, for speed and efficiency. Right, so there's floating point functions at the floating point level. We don't actually bring that down to integers and modify the trees that, that way because that would go much more slowly. <laughs> Um, but one of the things that this does is that it shows how we're always constructing meaning at these levels. By, by giving each bit a certain type of significance, that's how we build integers. By giving these two integers a certain type of significance, that's how we build floats. You know, that, that kind of thing. So we're, that, that's how we actually build meaning, and we're just making that really explicit 
in Scepter. Um, I'm going to skip the XML thing. Yep. <laughs> so let's just go right to data. Yeah. Process. Process. So do you want to say something about that? No, go ahead. It just that uh, we use what we call run trees, sort of self-eating, redu reducing trees instead of bytecode in the receptor virtual machines. And they function like a semantic stack. Semantic trees in Scepter can hold both code and data. So what I want to show you is what we call a run tree. A run tree is like a it's a, it's a code execution environment. It's kind of like a stack frame in that it has the code itself that will be run as well as the parameters um, that that code will be run against. So. I'm going to expand up this tree so we can see it. We've got the parameters themselves, and we've got um, some process. Now, I'll turn on the uh, structural definition um, so you can actually see what, what the structure of the items are as well as their semantic meaning. So the parameter is a list, and this is the case a list of one item that's going to be called for this process. The process is concatenation of string. What um, this what this tree demonstrate is, is a simple taking of a user profile and building a mailing label out of it that would be suitable for printing or something like that. So the parameter is a, this user profile. Let me describe the, the input to the process a little bit. Um, uh, a user profile is constructed out of a name and an address and an email. And a name is a first name and a last name. And an address is a street address, a city, a state, a zip, and a country. And when you're going to print a mailing label out, what you want to do is pluck out parts of that um, structural element and concatenate them together. So our process is just actually a set of nested um, uh, concatenate strings so that you can see what it looks like, as well as a return type of what the semantic type is that will be returned, which we here call the mailing label. So I'll open up the tree to the full depth so that we can see how it runs. Now, what you're seeing here is a rendering, a visualization of snapshots of the trees, of, of a running tree from the Scepter system. So what we've done in our testing environment is just spit out a bunch of trees as the system runs. And then we're using the D3 visualization library to create a nice picture um, kind of like an introspection of what would be going on internally in memory. You could think of this as a hex dump of the running code. But since the running code is not bytes and words, it's semantic trees, you get to look at it this way. So what we'll see as we run this is that um, you have these items here, which are the parameter references. This is the way in which in your stack frame, in essence, you're, you're copying values of variables that were um, called into the uh, running code so that when you're writing code, you can refer to parts of your parameters. Uh, the, so we call a parameter reference. Its structural type is a tree path. A tree path is a reference to a part of another tree. So in this case, the path is a numeric um, path down the tree from the top to the parts that need to be substituted in place. So now what I'm going to do is actually step us through the running code. Um, what you see at first there was a replacement of the um, parameter references. Then you see, oops, I just turned off the labels for uh, it maybe to look a little more clear. Uh, then you see the reduction of one process as one step of the reduction of the code. This is as if the CPU is running. Now we have some more parameter reference replacements. And uh, now we'll see the concatenate string run again and reduce. And finally, we'll have the last reduction and then cleaning up of the whole, quote, stack frame. Again, there's not a separate stack. It operates all as one. A semantic tree can act as a, a semantic stack at the same time as the code produces. So there you have your mailing label as the output. So this provides a sense of how you can use semantic trees as an environment for holding and running code uh, in a very interesting way. OK. So we've got semantic trees as the components that run the receptors. Now, what we knew we needed to do after that was figure out a way to be doing parsing and pattern matching, 
with these semantic trees. You've got to be able to actually compare parts of these trees. So we came up with a system um, that's very akin to regular expressions. We call it Semtrix. Yeah, so this is our semantic tree regular expressions. And you can just see an example here. This one is in the video. It's just a, a single shot of up in the upper right. You can see the Semtrix expression rendered in an ASCII format. Again, it, it's actually stored as a semantic tree, but to make it readable in a small space, we're just rendering this as if it's an, an ASCII expression. You can see that starting at the root is the slash. The percentage sign means walk. So find anywhere in this tree. Walk the tree to find any match that matches the request path segments, and then return those results. You can see the match results highlighted in red um, between that Semtrex expression. So it becomes a generalized parser that can parse any semantic structure or any protocol. This example comes from the idea of having an HTTP request as a semantic tree. And so part of what your um, application might do is um, do a regular expression, I mean a Semtrex into the path that was um, uh, passed in so you can figure out which host or which file to get as a result. Um, so one of the ways that this actually works in Scepter, in terms of the way the, the receptors are structured, is that they're a little bit similar to rules. We have expectation statements that are very similar to rules in Prolog that basically fire off when a match happens on the expectation. So first, you identify what carrier you're listening on, and then what pattern you're trying to match on that carrier. And if you get a match, then what happens is this trigger, this action gets fired up. And so one of the things about this is since the actions are themselves little code trees, this is suitable for parallel processing. You hand that off to a little, uh, to a different thread or to a different processor to actually process. Um, expectations can also be nested. And one of the interesting things is that listeners can be structured this way. You can plant a kind of event listener subscribe to an event in another receptor by, by providing an expectation and asking them to notify you, essentially, to plant this expectation and having the action be that you get notified when this state happens, when this change occurs. And then that also may trigger cascades of other changes from other expectations, which is part of how you can do layers of analysis in a multi-layered protocol. So part of what this enables is a little bit of a, a, a weird thing that we're, we call a self-describing protocol stack. Right, so the, the situation is that you've got a set of nested virtual machines that are all running with um, these um, expectations. And um, the big question is, how do you get them all to coordinate together? How do you get them to run and speak with each other? And the answer is that we have to have a, a generalized framework for creating um, uh, protocols. Thomas, is that you? I'm like Mark. Okay. Nope, nope, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so again, this pattern repeating of the, the carrier signal protocol, what does it take to have a self-describing protocol stack that you could speak to something that you didn't already have the protocol for by it specifying what protocol it's using, and then you being able to choose to install that protocol to interact with it if you want. So one of the things is you need to be able to listen on a more general carrier to receive the signal in the first place, then have a way for the protocol to be identified, as well as its semantics, its elements, the meaning of its elements, and its structure, and um, have an ability for the, to install the protocol to understand or process the signal. So the weird thing about um, Scepter protocols is that they're actually fully pluggable. We're used to calling things in life protocols that are really kind of human description documents, right? Like the HTTP 1.1 specification is almost 300 pages long of text trying to describe how to do this. It's not something that, that runs. In Scepter, to make all these things mashable, a protocol is actually pluggable. But in order to make it pluggable, you have, to decide, you have to specify the shape of the plugs at the end that you're plugging into, right? HTTP, for example, talks about all the, it specifies all of the transit in, in, in between information 
but it doesn't specify that it's a you know a document being served out at, at, to it at one end and being rendered in HTML at the other end or necessarily, right? It's not, it's trying to specify the middle and not so much the ends. And our specification actually has to contain both. So you can see here, you just define the role. HTTP is pretty simple. There's just server and client, and there's only two types of messages. There's request and response. So um, it ends up being a very simple type of flow, set of flows to, to define. Like SMTP is actually a much more complex specification in Scepter. And um, you can see how this maps as well with the expect statements, right, where you can say what carrier you're listening on, what pattern you're detecting, and then what action you're going to call. And for us, it's pretty simple. The action that you call is basically to hand a doc request on a, on a HTTP request to some sort of document handler by passing the, the, the file, sorry, the path, the file, and any query string parameters. And so then that, that means that there's, there's a document hand, handler specification somewhere else. We don't have to specify that in HTTP, but we're relying on that being specified to serve out the document. So if, if any of you are familiar with the whole Rails stack, you would, be, you would see that this shows up as some of the middleware um, um, type stuff that happens over there, where this actually um, makes us construct proper protocols from the ground up because you're creating for pluggability. And then one of the other interesting things is if you want to plug something in that plug a receptor in that doesn't have the right shape plug, if you will, not the right interfaces, you can also make receptors that are adapters, right? That convert one type of thing to another type of thing so that you can plug a different receptor in. So uh, the question then is, if you have a pluggable protocol and want to share that, how do you share it so that others can use it? And our answer is that you publish a receptor to the Scepter compository, um, where, all comp where all shared compositions can be stored. And, and it's like a big distributed hash table, sort of BitTorrenty type of thing. So imagine if the internet actually came originally <laughs> with a built-in GitHub that is stored as a distributed hash table that you could immediately share things um, for communicating over that protocol. Sure. So um, one of the things is it provides the address space to identify the protocol semantics and structures, as well as providing a space for receptors to be shared as installable packages that function just like installing an app, an app on your phone or an app marketplace. Um, recept you also, in the compository, you, you branch from an identifier down to versions and sub-branches so that when you put a new version of a receptor, the identity of it doesn't change. The address of it doesn't change. You just you sub-address down to the version that you want inside of that. And then you publish to the compository via a triangulation process of uh, both an author and a person reviewing it, staking their reputation on um, that this is what it says it is and does what it says it does. Because um, you can part of what we're trying to do also is build an immune system into the compository to keep people from installing uh, virus-type stuff, you know, based on the um, reputation of um, both authors and reviewers. So, because receptors can really um, be, receptors are going to live in the virtual machine host that um, is on one given machine, and so they're only interacting with the receptors on that virtual machine host, it means that we also have to have some kind of network to make this work at a larger scale. So, to reach receptors, receptors on other machines, they speak to their local instance of a special receptor called the receptor net receptor, which does the synchronization for delivering, method, uh, delivering messages. We're not going to talk too much about the Scepter network because we haven't implemented a lot of the designs yet, but we wanted to share some of the key aspects of our approach so that you can get a flavor of it. Plus, actually, we want to end pretty quickly so you can ask questions. Yeah, so really one of the interesting things about it is that, that the network messages are really happening through the Byzantine fault tolerance synchronization between Scepter net receptors. 
that's a very different approach. Also, because people can triangulate, declare themselves and each other into the network address space, um, there's no there's a UUID type of scenario, and there's no um, topology in the network addresses. So you have to have the network receptors be learning about their local network top topology to be able to put a routing layer on top of that. Um, and another thing about it is <clears throat> that scepter, the scepter network receptor is essentially just another receptor. So that means that you can share new versions of it in the repository, and you can update versions of your fundamental networking protocol um, from the repository, as well as back, um, maintain backward compatibility. If you need to speak to somebody speaking in the earlier version, you can pull that one out of the, the compository. And we see this as really vital because it's, it's optimized for evolution. And if you think about um, how long it's been taking us to try to do the, the conversion from IPv4 to IPv6, it's going to be like a 30-year span for us to have made that, that change. And we see the need for those types of changes to happen faster and be built right into the system. So that's it. A spoonful of scepter really quick. It covers a wide range. Thank you very much for listening and for giving us the opportunity to talk here. And uh, I guess we should open it up for questions. Okay, uh, folks, type in your question into the chat room. So, so I have a question uh, for you. Uh, uh, so, so when you were saying before that you couldn't store data uh, without any meaning or, or context, that, that's pretty much almost how our brains work, right? I mean, if we, if we storing numbers, you know, there's always there's always an association that we keep with it. You know, it's a phone number, date of birth, you know, whatever, you know, how much cash I have in my pocket. You know, it's just, you know, I, I can't think of any unattached data that's flowing, you know, floating in my mind, you know. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you say that too, because um, what just happened? Nothing, it's just that this covers the thing. Oh, so. It's okay, go ahead. Doesn't work. Keep going. Go ahead and answer the question. Sorry. Um, the, I was trying to actually share that so it would be visible. Um, it, it's, interesting, it's interesting that you say that too because I think you see a lot of ways we're trying to solve the problem of contextless data. You know, all the semantic web work and that type of stuff. We're trying to build meaning back into the data that doesn't, that has now lost its, its context. And we're saying let's just keep it together from the, from the base level. We have a question on there from Benjamin. Uh, how can one cell determine the reliability of another cell? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. I think the answer to that comes in the way we run the compository. Um, the compository, when you create a receptor package and you store it in the compository, one of the things that you have to do is sign it um, along with your own identity for triangulation purposes. So it's a, it's a fairly standard code signing notion, but all of the the data is frozen at a given version with a signature. So when you go to install a node in your local virtual machine host, you know that you're running something that comes from the compository that is exactly what it is. And you can get the signature from a peer that you trust, even if you're getting in a, sort of in a BitTorrenty distributed hash table kind of way, if you're getting lots of parts of the receptor from multiple places at once, if you, you, can, you can get the signature from somebody that you trust to make sure that you've assembled something that has integrity. The other thing is that the way that we interface with the data slice, with the, with the persistent data engine, is that um, the instance data that um, a receptor is storing, in other words, the data that is, that is instantiated and is changing, is separate from the receptor package. So that when we put a receptor to sleep, like a virtual machine says, okay, this receptor has been inactive for a while and to save more memory, I'm gonna put it to sleep. And it, it goes, all, we, all you have to do is serialize any unsynchronized um, instance data into the data store because when we recreate that receptor again, we essentially recreate the, the process part of running code, the kind of the, the membrane and, and stuff around the instance data, we um, instantiate that from source again. So you, you, 
it's always kind of cleaning itself up as well in terms of memory corruption. It's always going from the established authoritative source. Oh, so Benjamin has another follow-up on that. I'm thinking more about performance over time. Does its output match what's ex expected? Um, so the way in which we address that is with, with having um, receptors have separate instances that are running, perhaps in the same virtual machine, perhaps even on different virtual machine hosts. And so because a receptor is synchronizing its output with other receptors of the exact same type, not, not even type, but instance, they um, will synchronize with each other and they can check their outputs with each other to confirm that they're actually the same kind of output. Yeah, w one thing to note about that is our implementation of Byzantine fault tolerance is different than some of the ones done on other platforms, like the uh, like a blockchain le ledger or Paxos or things like that, where basically you can't commit something, you can't save something until you've reached agreement. And we're taking a more atomic approach where you're running a receptor of a cryptocurrency on your machine, you can trust your receptor. So you can make an interaction and make a commit locally. And then the data synchronization is the part that negotiates um, the consensus on that. And so what that means is that we actually have multiple states of reality um, that are always trying to re-consensualize. And sometimes they can't reconcile. Um, so, but that's okay, because that's actually designing for forking. Exactly. So you may have a group of them that go off in one direction, and, and you may actually decide that you, these groups want to fork because they represent two totally different realities. In a lot of cases, what will happen is I tried to do a transaction with Eric. Eric declined the transaction, and I'm just going to avoid my transaction when I try to synchronize. Another question from... Uh, so every time a new programming language emerges, there's one specific motivation for it. For example, it could be driven by the desire to improve security, to avoid buffer overflow attacks, by new language concepts like JavaScript does, um, easier to use in certain application domains, etc. So what's been your motivation? Um, we actually tried to start there a little bit. Our, our, this emerged out of work that we were doing in the alternative currency space where we wanted um, complete uh, decentralization and distribution and resilience and a whole bunch of things that we weren't being able to get from existing um, platforms and approaches. And what has been more our inspiration than our motivation um, has been actually modeling this as much as possible off of nature, off of physics and biology and the way that nature builds distributed, natural, decentralized systems to be resilient. And it has led us to a, a very different kind of design that seems pretty robust and has been very easy. It's been really great, the bootstrapping process of building on our own tools. Um, once we've built something, how being able to use that to build the next thing has been very encouraging tends to make us think we're on a good path. So another sort of more high-level answer to that question is um, what we've been interested in creating is the possibility of much greater levels of collective knowledge, of the capacity of the social organism to interact with itself. And we don't think you can do that safely without powerfully distributed agent systems. And so this platform is built in service of that capacity. <clears throat> From... Um and from my perspective, um, I, you know, what, what Eric and Arthur were doing really spoke to me in terms of the, the really higher level um, aspects of creating very, very modular uh, applications. Uh, as I wrote in the chat, right now, from my perspective, applications are incredibly monolithic. They, they, do, they do what the programmer or, you know, Microsoft or Apple, whatever, wants you to do. And... Um, that just seems really um, archaic uh, in, in a sense, because really what I want to be able to do is put in my own visualizations, uh, wire up the information and the data flow in my own way, uh, be able to adapt to new streams of data. You know, when Twitter, when Twitter woke up on the Internet, you know, there's a whole other source of interesting information to mine. And so from, from what, I, what, what HOPE attempts to demonstrate or illustrate is that 
these that that applications can really be composable from smaller autonomous computing units and this whole concept uh, that Eric and Arthur put together just uh, really spoke volumes to me about how this architecture could be used um, at a very high level to achieve that goal. Well, do we have other questions? Oh, by the way, that was Mark Clifton since his ID doesn't, his name doesn't show up. So <laughs> you weren't here at the beginning of the call when you heard his voice. <laughs> Do we have any other questions that people would uh, like to answer? There was a question from uh, Mark Clifton about, um, actually from um, Matthew about um, future directions. Next pieces. Um, so yeah, Matthew's asking to what, what's next. Um, for us, the short term things have to do with actually completing the Byzantine fault tolerance synchronization stuff that we're doing and the in, in tandem with that, the back end network um, uh, routing infrastructure and that type of stuff. That's some of the short term stuff that we're in the midst of trying to implement at the moment. Longer term path for us has to do with getting all of this low level infrastructure complete and then tackling communication solutions. Like we want to build a, a platform on here that at the moment we're calling Streamscapes because it's a place where you can um, unify all of your different communication streams into one landscape that you can control and manage uh, yourself. So being able to connect to any communication protocol, whether that be you know, Skype or your, your email or instant messages, lots of different email accounts, your Facebook feed, your Twitter, IRS feed, feed Twitter, you know, all those, those types of things, being able to pull them together into one space that you can organize so that you can, for example, like, I could actually grab a stream of my communications with Eric, whether that was by text message or by voicemail or phone call logs or Skype or tweets or Facebook messages and be able to actually see, because you know how that thing happens in this overwhelming information age of, oh, this guy posted this thing I was really interested in. Where, where was that? Where did I see that? Was that on Twitter? Was that on Facebook? Was that you know, or Eric gave me this phone number. Was that in a text message? Was that in a Skype chat? And it takes you 10 minutes just to find the right channel where the information was instead of being able to actually control all of our information into one space that you store a copy of. But the thing is that if you've got that kind of um, communication space and you're building it off of something that's um, uh, constructed out of semantic trees, that means, and the kinds of protocols that we're talking about, it means that we can move all kinds of powerful social interactions into our base communication stream. And that's the next step after that, which is to be able to do group coordination with this kind of protocol, this kind of power of protocols and understanding the data that you've got, which then allows us to build on top of that to the goal that I said originally. Right. So building this composability, our first thing is to compose work, uh, sorry, information flows on top of that with all these different communication tools. On top of that, to be able to compose workflows. So managing agreement and, and you know, approval sequences or like you know, project management, ticketing, yeah. uh, like GitHub tickets or issues, <laughs> it's scheduling, all that kind of stuff that should be integrated into your base uh, communications package. And then finally, on top of that, we get to what started us in the process, which is currencies. Um, and, by, flows. And, and by currencies, we don't just mean money. We mean those things which give social organisms value. Let's see. Uh, any other questions? Dream candidate walk through the door tomorrow to help build Byzantine fault tolerance side. What skills would they have? <laughs> Love that. Um, I, ideally, they would be able to program in C. Since we want this to be again very lightweight, portable, compilable to lots of different platforms. Um, and have some experience with other approaches, whether that be um, Paxos or uh, you know, other Byzantine fault tolerance tools, so we don't have to um, reinvent the wheel altogether, that we can learn from some of the lessons other people have done. Um, and that even people who, who, so some of what we're looking for, by the way, right now, is some other people to do pair programming. And stuff. So if you're a coder and um, this seems like an exciting project, we can set up time to, to work on it together. Yep, absolutely. 
Let's see. We're looking for more of the questions here. Um, the question is not if um, this is from um, Sahar. Although the question is not if this is going to be reality and more about when, the world has not shown much interest in creating their own money. Um, yeah, I guess I want to clarify. When we use the word currencies, we're not using the same word as money. Like in English, we kind of use currency and money interchangeably. Um, we have this whole body of work about kind of reclaiming the word currency to be more akin to, you can think of it like a current, a flow, C, the ability to see flows. So we create shared symbol systems all the time to be able to see flows. Like a college degree is a reputation currency. And to get that degree, you have to fulfill the degree, degree requirements. You need 12 credits of this and 15 credits of this and 25 credits of that. And the credits are a unit of account currency, counting your, your um, hours of your coursework in these different domains. But the credits only count if you get a good enough grade. And the grades are a performance metric currency attempting to measure how well you're learning the content of the course. And you could say that the flow of students in an undergraduate institution is all organized by those three non-monetary currencies, and they have different issuers. The professors issue the grades, the departments issue the credits, the university issues the degree. And so when we start looking at social flows that way, we're doing those things all over the place. It's not true that people are not adopting those things. We're adopting those things by dozens a day almost. I mean, whether it be Amazon product reviews and ratings or seller reviews and ratings and eBay, ratings and movie scores and all of the all of the systems in gamified websites they're all examples of that except they live in silos like somebody else was mentioning in here all, all of those data packages live in large silos and they don't exist in uh, an interoperable grammatic space and scepter is our answer to that it's the interoperable grammatic space for creating these kinds of power interacting informa formal information systems that will help us build the kind of collective um, wealth that we think is possible. And um, I think there's some major impediments to uh, the creation of alternative money in that the way we think of money, um, it, you have a huge advantage by having a monopoly, by having the government require it for taxes and legal tender and all sorts of things like that, which make it not so easy a space to innovate in, but the space that we're calling currency is a much larger innovation space, and you see a lot of adoption of that happening all over the place. And I think starts to move its way into the exchangeable value space, even when they're not exchangeable currencies. Like if you think about things like couch surfing, um, have providing millions of bed nights <laughs> of uh, housing a year for people who travel, that's enabling that through reputation currencies about the people and whether or not you want to invite them in your home rather than monetary currencies. And it's still creating an actual exchange of value of housing. So, so that's a, a little overview of some of the ideas on the, on the motivation side. But I wonder if there are any more questions about Scepter that we can answer or because we've gone over about the hour time frame. I don't know um, how much time Tomas you've got allocated for it. Uh, you can go on as long as you want, as long as there's questions, you know. Great. Folks, any more, any more questions? Matthew wrote same question regarding Streamscapes, but I don't know what. Oh, he's about the dream cabinet, can, candidate. Same, so the same question about a dream candidate for Streamscapes. I don't know. It's, it's almost premature, um, but somebody who'd be willing to learn how to specify communication protocols in Scepter and start building pluggable communication protocols so we can easily plug into Twitter and email and Facebook feeds and all that kind of stuff because what all we have to essentially do is build a Scepter version of the specification of those protocols and interface with them and then suddenly everything else in Scepter can talk to them. We, we created a demo of Streamscapes a long time ago. It was built in uh, Clojure and this is part of when we realized, oh boy, we've got a lot of work to do to actually make that pluggability. And we learned um, a couple of those specs. I wrote uh, a receptor for IRC and for parts of Twitter. And there's a lot of knowledge that's needed for each one of the channels. So we're going to need lots of people who are building the different channels that will then show up as pluggable elements. Um, and, but once they're there, it should be pretty easy and interesting. And part of what we're hoping in the compository as well is that 
if you have some specialized system, you know, whether it's a CRM system that your company uses or some legacy system, or you want to plug into Arduino controllers or, you know, whatever the thing is, that people will publish some of their own um, adapters to the compository, and that builds uh, an ecosystem of um, these interfaces and protocols growing. I think that's complete. I don't see any more questions. So thank you for the opportunity to share this stuff. We're really excited about it. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, thank you, Art, um, and you know, th thank you for um, you know, great set of slides, um, uh, folks. If you have any questions, you can direct, you know, directly ask, uh, you know, uh, Art and 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 Matthew and sorry and um, and Eric there, uh, just just through uh, uh, through the uh, website that they have listed there. Um, uh, seeing that we don't have any more questions, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you, folks. The recording uh, of this session will be up on the KIT.MIT website in like a couple of hours, as soon as as soon as the WebEx server you know generates it. Um, thank you again, and we hope to see you uh, next month. Uh, you know, first Thursdays of the month at 1 p.m. East. Okay, folks. Thank you so much. <laughs>